I wish that my younger self would have known how valuable and cherished Gina should be. Mm -hmm. I think that um, society, um, as well as you know, social media, it's on display as um, something to be used and tossed about. And I think that that there needs to be more care with with how we treat her. And you know, she's she's that other person. So um, I I think we need to we we do need to value her more. Because if we value her more, then we can value the whole person more. Welcome to the Recycle Podcast, where we discuss everyday issues from a mental health perspective. We are your hosts, Dr. Rashonda Strickland, Dr. LaFanya jones Hines, and Dr. Nichelle Wall. Welcome back to session 130, Shrink Wrapped with Dr. Shalon F. Harris. Today's mood music is brought to you by Lauren Hill, Doo-Wop, That Thing. Hey, interns. We missed y'all. Yes. Lots. <laughs> yes. We hope y'all missed us too, because we got some new good stuff for you. So today, we're going to be interviewing Dr. Shalon Harris, who is a new full-time TWU faculty member in the College of Nursing, working in her second year with TWU's online family nurse practitioner program. Before coming to TWU, Dr. Harris worked as an adjunct clinical assistant professor at Baylor University Nurse Midwifery. <laughs> DMP, I have to practice it, y'all. DMP program in 2021. Dr. Harris received a Bachelor of Science in Biology in 1996 and a Bachelor of Science in Nursing in 1998 from mm -hmm. Abilene Christian University. She attended Park Parkland School of Nursing in 1998 and Nurse Midwifery Certificate <laughs> in. 2004. She has a lot of credentials, y'all. So I'm going to let her talk to her about herself because if I keep trying to read this, I'm going to watch it. Up. So I'm just going to let her tell us whatever else she needs to tell us about her bio. Well, interns, welcome Dr. Shalon Harris. Yay! Hello, welcome, welcome. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you for having me uh, join you ladies on the show. I've loved the podcast and I am just thrilled to be here today. Is there anything you want to tell our interns about yourself? Well, currently I work, um, yes, I work a lot of <laughs> different positions and different jobs. The, the benefit of being in advanced practice um, nurse is that I have the ability to work in so many different areas. So as a family nurse practitioner, I can work across all health spectrums, across all age groups. And so women's health has just been my niche, what I've chosen to focus on. But I also enjoy working with the pediatric or the adolescent population. So Although I work full time at TWU, Texas Women's University, um, as a faculty member on the online program, I also work part time at Parkland um, Hospital still um, in their midwifery, their labor and delivery unit as a nurse midwife. And then I also work part time in a pediatric clinic here closer to home. So I stay pretty busy, especially with side businesses and um, different things <laughs> to help uh, grow my portfolio with, you know, multiple streams of income so that I'm not settling for just one thing. I know that's right. I told y'all she had a lot going on. If y'all would have thought I was going to be able to read that, <laughs> mm -mm, mm -mm, my lips was going to all be messed up. She mm. got jobs. She got bags. <laughs> and she's also my sister. <laughs> <laughs> so we're going to hop right in to the questions. Dr. Strickland, you want to open us up? Sure. Um, what is something that you wish more women knew about vaginal health? Because, you know, our mama don't tell us a whole lot of stuff coming up. Uh, we got to learn the hard way. 
Yeah, that's that. Like you said, a lot of a lot of women don't talk to their children, their young girls about their vaginas. You know, I started very early with my daughter. You know, hey, let's name it so that when we, you know, something's going on, we know what's we know what it is. So her name was Gina, and so Gina had rules. Gina was washed every day. Gina, you know, no stinky Gina's allowed in the house. If something's wrong with Gina, you let us know what's going on. No one is allowed to touch Gina, you know, so she learned at an early age to bathe herself so that there was no reason for anyone to have to touch Gina other than herself. Um, so I think it's very important that we learn about our bodies early. You know, again, I wasn't taught very early about about myself, we did learn the hard way. We learned from others telling us what it's supposed to do, what it's supposed to be like, and you know, mm -hmm. a lot of different things. But unfortunately, um, we find out a little too late when there's a problem sometimes. Mm -hmm. I have a question. Um, one of the things you just said is China is not supposed to have a smell or it's not supposed to have a bad smell. So what, because a lot of people say that Gina is supposed to have a smell. Um, so what smell should we be warned about? <laughs> <laughs> it's That's a good question. So the vagina does have a natural, almost musk, musty type of smell um, in its natural mm -hmm. habitat. That's if it's, if it's um, healthy, if there has been no perfumes, deodorant, sprays, different things that have been added that can change the pH of the vagina. When the pH is changed, then you get those different smells that may smell a little fishy, that may smell a little um, yeasty. You know, if you pull your underwear down and you smell bread, then that's a problem. You know, if you pull your underwear down and you're thinking, where's the sushi? That's also a problem. <laughs> I was thinking the same. You get some help. Yeah, I was just thinking about, you know, when you were saying like, you wish you would have known some things when you were younger. Uh, something that I wish I would have known when I was younger is that what you eat comes through your body mm -hmm. like I can remember the first time I had asparagus oh, and then went to the bathroom and I was like whoa 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 <laughs> like I'm going to the doctor what is going on here <laughs> what happened here yeah. you know it would be really nice to be able to be educated and have like okay so what you digest is going to filter through your body in more way than just one exactly and I think the other thing that I wish I would have known as well is once you start uh, being intimate your body your pH change as well Mm -hmm. And so you can have a different smell to China. Yes, yeah. exactly. All those things. <laughs> it's, it's, it's important to make sure what you eat, um, like I said, it changes your pH. Um, so it's important to make sure that you limit the intake of sugars, alcohol. Um, those types of things can also change the pH of the vagina. And then sperm itself will definitely be a factor in what changes your uh, vaginal pH. And I think that is something that I I know I don't have no real statistics on this, but my spirit is going to tell me like 90 to 95 percent of women have no idea mm -hmm. that, you know, you really have to be aware that when you start being intimate with your partner, especially if there's, you know, um, ejaculation, you know, internally, like that's going to do something mm -hmm. uh, besides just have a baby. Right. Mm -hmm. Because he eats things too that come through his you know and he yeah. eat things that 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 too so if that ain't clean either i think people mm -hmm. just don't realize that that's a whole micro environment mm -hmm. and exactly. any little thing that you add or take away impacts it yeah. absolutely yep that, that is absolutely correct mm -hmm. all of that mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> You know, and so since we love to talk about black women on this show, of course, you know, we got three now our bonus black woman here. Um, so when you think about like health conditions that we experience, are there things that we tend to struggle with disproportionately to other uh, races or demographics? Well, I think when it comes to the vagina, one thing that's pretty um, prominent that we don't really talk about is bacterial vaginosis. 
Now, whether or not that's a sexually transmitted disease that, you know, it goes back and forth when you look at different studies. But for the most part, it is pretty prominent um, among African-American and Hispanic women. And so mm. part of the reason is, again, the change in the, the pH of the body. And so what happens with that is um, women sometimes will have like an uh, excess amount of discharge. It may be a little bit gray. It may be a little bit cloudy. But one of the more important things that um, kind of stands out with it is that it gives off a fishy smell. And so with that fishy smell, of course, it's something that should be investigated. It definitely can be treated. And it's something that the provider can can um, diagnose there in the clinic with, you know, um, a microscope. So it's pretty easy to detect if it's present, pretty easy to treat. One of the things um, that women may sometimes do when they have a discharge is try to treat themselves over the counter with different things. Mm -hmm. And so the important thing is to know that if BV is not properly treated, that it can lead to other female health issues such as preterm birth. It can lead to um, um, further issues with the uterus. Um, oh, wow. really, you really want to take a look at it. What, the important thing is, you know, of course, is preterm birth. We don't want um, women to have um babies early, earlier than normal. So um, it's important not just for BV, but other sexually transmitted infections to get them investigated and treated properly, not just with over-the-counter, not just with um, some type of home remedy to say, just let me get this discharge stopped. Because of course, mm -hmm. we women out there are still douching we won't, we really yeah. don't want them to do that. And so they think that this is going to clear up the discharge that they're having, possibly wash away whatever um, infection is there. And that's, that's not going to happen. And so we need women to be educated about the fact that if you feel like something is wrong, if this is not normal for your body, then you need to seek help so that, mm -hmm. so that you can properly be treated. Yeah. It's so sad because there's such an embarrassment around vaginal health and anything related to, yeah. you know, that whole, really the reproductive system yeah. for women. And it, there's such a fear of, you know, I'm going to be shamed or judged or uh, something like that. And people tend to deal with stuff way longer than what they really need to. Mm -hmm. It right. makes me wonder like, if it's since, you know, we didn't have this information, um, if women are shamed by it because, you know, usually when you start having those type of complications it's because you're having sex. That's um, possible. We do live in a very um, Christian or religious Bible environment Bible. in mm -hmm. America, and we uh, tend to be very judgmental about anything that doesn't abide by what we think mm -hmm. is correct. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. So I could definitely see that. So I well, would just... I'm Go sorry. Ahead. Let me add to that the fact that with BV, um, again, it's a change in in the the vaginal pH. So just leaving on, like, say your um, swimsuit too long, mm -hmm. or yeah. your workout clothes mm -hmm. that may be damp from sweat, those types of things can change the pH. Mm -hmm. So I, I agree. The stigma of well, if something is going on down there, then you know you must be doing something you're not supposed to be doing. But it can happen, and it can occur from other things other mm -hmm. than sex, and especially if you're not cleaning, say. It's Valentine's, so maybe you're doing some stuff with some other toys, mm -hmm. um, <laughs> things that aren't cleaned properly. Yeah. Um, can also change the pH of your of your vagina. So you want to make sure that all of those things are taken into consideration. So when you go work out, um, take those wet clothes off immediately. If you're yeah. going to um, do some other things that are a little bit... Uh, mm -hmm. I'll say risque. Um, <laughs> you know, wash those things before and after. Make sure that if um, you're at a situation to where there will be, um, how can I say, um, oral sex involved, make sure mm -hmm. that your partner brushes his teeth. Hygiene mm -hmm. is important, you know, because yes. that's going to affect 
your vaginal pH. Mm -hmm. yeah. That's good to know. So women interns, don't be afraid of what's going on down there. Go get it checked out. It mm -hmm. does not necessarily mean that you are, you know, doing freaky things. It could be, but it doesn't have to be. Mm -hmm. Agreed. Right. Absolutely. So since we're speaking of like cleanliness and taking care of, <laughs> that's a great segue, Dr. Harris. <laughs> um, so there's been a lot of conversation online, you know, about how people wash their body. Do they use a washcloth? Do they wash their legs and wash their feet and all kinds of things? Um, <laughs> you use soap, you use soap. Right. You know, and then what type of soaps do you use? So when, when it comes to cleaning the, you know, the vaginal area, what is best practice? Best practice would be, of course, um, starting with when you go to the restroom, um, wiping front to back. We've heard that. Some people say, well, I've never done that. I've never had a UTI or any type of infections or whatever. Great. It could be an anatomical thing that maybe you um, have not been um you have not been one of those lucky, you know, you've been one of those lucky people that hadn't gotten that type of infection from improper wiping. But for the most part, it is best to wipe front to back, especially um, after um, a bowel movement, because you don't want to introduce those type of um, organisms into the urethra to get a UTI or the vagina that may cause a again, disturbance in the pH that will lead to some type of discharge or infection. Um, as far as washing, um, mild soap, unscented is best, but mild soap and water, yes, soap and water. But for the most part, you can pretty much... Um, you can pretty much take things like bubble baths, just limit them, limit the type of things that you put in the water because it is going to disturb the pH. So if you like to do those uh, bath bombs, just know what's being used in it and limit that so that you're not, um, you're not changing the pH of the vagina on a regular basis with the bath soaps or whatever it is that you might be putting in there. Um, I think, I think, <laughs> I think some women, um, you know, there's lots of feminine products for, um, keeping yourself clean. You have to look into those things as far as the, you know, the scent and where you're using them. Sometimes they're, you know, they're good for on the go, but again, soap and water is going to be the best thing. And so when you say mild soap, what do you consider to be mild? Um, like something like Dove or, you know, Dove has the sensitive skin formulas. Dial is even pretty good, um, but Dial also has lots of different scents that come with it. So mm -hmm. you have to know what your body can tolerate. Um, sometimes it is a trial and error, um, but um, some of those things that may be great for the skin, you know, like caress or different things like it, may not be very good for Gina. So mm -hmm. she will definitely let you know when she doesn't like it. Yeah. Yeah. Very sensitive. Yeah. yeah. And Dr. Harris, can you speak more on the difference between the vulva and the vagina so that people understand what part they're cleaning? <laughs> All of it needs to be clean. Because <laughs> you know. But, you know, the vulva, the part that includes the labia majora, the labia minor, that's, you know, in layman's terms, the large and the small lips, you know, that part, um, all of that needs to be clean. Sometimes she gets a little cheesy, as my daughter would say. That means that you need to take your time and get up in there because you need to make sure that you clean all of those things because that can develop infections without being cleaned properly. The vagina itself is further on down. So if people haven't taken a mirror or don't know what is going on down there, there's lots of different parts to the one lady part. So it's important to make sure that you investigate and clean properly. So you may have to get a mirror. You may have to say, okay, so I've been washing this outer part right here, the vulva part, and it's something else going down, down there. Yeah, go look, take a look and figure this out. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Don't want to be hiding things in the crevices, especially <laughs> No. Mm -hmm. Can't be scared to look at yourself. No. 
but a lot of people are unfortunately i know mm-hmm. that's so weird it's your body <laughs> yeah well if you're told that it's nasty yeah. or inappropriate to touch, touch. it mm-hmm. you know that doesn't all of a sudden change once you are partnered mm-hmm. and i think people don't realize that when we have the that fear mm-hmm. uh teaching mm-hmm. is very difficult to overcome that once you are in a committed relationship or marriage mm-hmm. so don't recommend you know uh doing that to your kids and then they struggle with mm-hmm. their bodies later yeah i have women that i see that still haven't looked at their vulva mm-hmm. or their vagina or any of that stuff not even their breast so it's just kind of like okay we got a lot of work to do mm-hmm. to break down break that, that down mm-hmm. and for them to start loving their body yeah so what also happens without knowing what's going on down there um is that they don't know what Gina likes mm-hmm. 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 good point mm-hmm. and that i think that, that you know without touching and exploring yourself in a healthy way then you don't know how you like to be touched in order mm-hmm to satisfy you at a later point in time, of course. Um, so I think this, you know, like you said, we, we do need education on our bodies. We need education, you know, because un- unfortunately I do have um, young girls that I have had to uh, participate in their delivery and mm-hmm. I have to do a crash, you know, sex education course of, mm-hmm. Do you understand how you got pregnant? Do you understand where this baby is about to come from? Mm -hmm. You know, because um, there's some things that are going to be happening here. And I need you to be at least in the know, maybe not the understanding at this point, but in the know of what is about to happen here, other Mm -hmm. than the fact that you're going to have a baby in your arms. It takes some stuff happening down there in order to be able to get that baby in your arms. And mm-hmm. so without knowing, oh, okay, there's more than one hole down there. Oh, okay. mm-hmm. that's where it's coming from. Oh, okay. So mm-hmm. yeah, I have to play auntie, mommy, whatever it is to make sure that they understand what's about to happen. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I think this is one of the you know, not that I don't think that male doctors or male medical practitioners couldn't do this, but I do think this is one of the benefits of having women in the medical space, Mm -hmm. um, because sometimes it can be difficult hearing that kind of information or like taking a lot of that in at one time. Um, And, you know, unfortunately, you know, we sometimes are just a little bit more comfortable uh, having a female presence because, you know, you have the same things that I have. Mm -hmm. Um, So you know how they work. Again, I understand that male medical (laughs) practitioners know what the things are, but it's a little bit different when I can say, okay, this is how you do this. This is how you take care of this. This is how um, things are going to look. This is what it's going to feel like, um, you know, from real world experience. Yeah. Right. Mm -mm -mm. Well, since we're, you know, still kind of talking about health and, you know, how to take care of, you know, our our vaginal area. uh, One thing that I was always wondering, so we're in a, we have a very like visual society and, you know, unfortunately, um, pornography is something (laughs) that has changed the way people uh, present themselves. Um, Is there any health issue or any reason why we should or should not, you know, shave, wax, um, or, you know, versus being, you know, completely natural? Well, um, the hair is there for a reason. And so the reason or the purpose of the vaginal hair is to help prevent infections. The skin Mm -hmm. in that area is very sensitive. Um, prone to infection, very easy. So it's very important to make sure that um, you take care of the area. Now, whether or not to say absolutely no or absolutely yes, you know, that's going to be an individual preference. And the important part is whatever it is that you do, that you make sure that everything is clean. So if you're planning to shave, 
Make sure the area is clean thoroughly before and after if you're planning the wax. Same thing. Um, because you don't want to get an infection there, you know, um, some type of bacteria, then, you know, you're just trying to remove hair and they end up removing a whole labia because of some type of infection that sets in a dirty mm -hmm. razor, you know, um, mm -hmm. some people are prone to ingrown hairs, folliculitis. And so that can be an issue, um, with removing the hair totally. And so the recommendation, of course, is not necessarily to remove all of the hair, but to trim it very low. Um, and some people, because of the, um, you know, the visual of all of that and what's out, you know, in today's time, that may not be the preference. But again, if that's not your preference, that's okay too. Just be clean about whatever it is that you do. So that's the important part. Gotcha. Okay. Agreed. Okay. So, uh, men interns, sometimes it's not healthy to shave down there. <laughs> <laughs> yes, that's going to be very individual. Yes. yes. Okay. So, now that we're talking about cleaning that area, because, you know, usually that's what men like, uh, what are some reasons sex can be painful? Hmm. Well, there's a lot of reasons um, that sex can be painful. And I think um, one of the first things to determine is when there's pain with sex, is it with every instance of sex? Or, you know, so like, mm -hmm. is it pain with just intercourse, pain with penetration? Is there some type of pain going on? Um, when she's aroused and there's no penetration? Is there some type of pain that occurs with um, when she reaches an orgasm? You know, so there's different types of pain and different levels of pain. And so the key would be to determine when it is, how severe it is, and if it's something that could be a problem. One thing to investigate is whether or not there's been any past sexual trauma. With past sexual trauma, um, the body itself could have issues with relaxing enough for penetration. No matter, you know, even if that is something that she's wanting and willing to do at this particular time, it may be because of past trauma that the body just is not allowing her to be able to relax and enjoy the situation. But Sometimes um, pain can be caused by um, the maybe laceration or an episiotomy from childbirth, and there's a lot of scar tissue that has built up, so it makes it uncomfortable. It could be because of the way that the laceration or the episiotomy was repaired. You know, um, that can also cause some pain during sex. Um, Sometimes it could be because of an abdominal or urinary problem, um, some type of painful bladder syndrome issues. It could be even as much as um, irritable, irritable bowel syndrome where, you know, the intestines are inflamed or Crohn's disease. So it causes a lower abdominal discomfort with penetration. So there is like so many different things that can be related to pain during intercourse. But I think one of the main things is, has she allowed her body to get ready for the occasion? Mm -hmm. Makes a lot of sense. Mm -hmm. That is a good one. Can't just slide up in there. What ain't no you slide. Know? You know? <laughs> Bumping up against. <laughs> okay. So with that being said, what causes women to not be able to have an orgasm? You know, it sounds like these questions are simple, but they're so... I was thinking that's <laughs> not super complicated. <laughs> yeah, there's a lot... Complex answer. Right. There's a lot that goes into it. And of course, if, if there's a concern... Um, always want to make sure that she reaches out to her healthcare provider because there's so many different aspects that should be investigated. Um, you know, 
definitely want to look into the fact that are, is she and her partner communicating? Does she know what what it takes for her to have an orgasm? Um, you know, we as women, yeah, we as women, we're doing a lot of stuff and um, not all the time are we ready for the, um, I say, the event to occur. So while, you know, in the process, we may be thinking about, oh, yeah, I forgot to get this at the grocery store or I need to get my car. Uh, <laughs> I cannot tell you the number of clients you know, that I've talked uh, to about that. <laughs> I'm just, you know, as a busy woman, I'm just saying. Uh, so sometimes mm -hmm. I'm not there yet mentally, so I'm mm -hmm. not going to be there physically. You know, and it yeah. may come later. And so we just have to make sure that we are put in the right environment to help us get there. Now, not to say that that's always the case. Sometimes it could be just simply you're not hitting the right spot to get me there. It can mm -hmm. sometimes be, um, I think that a lot of times it is very emotional. And I think that she has to, again, understand and know what it takes for her to get into the mood and to be able to get herself there. Because if she, I, I won't say all the time, but I think that if she doesn't know how to get there by herself, she's not going to know how to get there with someone else. Mm -hmm. And they can be doing all kind of tricks. And <laughs> you just, you know, yeah. You, you just can't, you just can't do it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I, oh, I'm sorry. Go ahead. Well, I was just going to, because you said, um, have you, has she had the conversation with her partner? How do you have that conversation with your partner? Because, you know, sometimes egos be very fragile, especially when they think they're doing something. <laughs> I'm sorry. I, you know, I, <laughs> it just is what it is. It is. And I think that sometimes, um, it's, it's a gentle conversation that has to be had. Mm -hmm. If yeah. you're in the midst of throws and you're like, hey, so that ain't working. That's probably not the best way to say, say that. So you right. might just want to say, so I really like when you do this. Mm -hmm. you know, and maybe they start doing that and you'd be like, yeah, that's really not it. Don't say that out loud. You say, mm -hmm. so how about if you do it like this? Let me show you. Let me mm -hmm. help you do this. And, you know, you just kind of introduce it slowly um, mm -hmm. and gently. Um, and then, you know, you go with it from there. And then maybe sit down later and say, hey, I really enjoyed when, you know, people don't do that. People don't. But I oh, mean, if you, you want to have a lasting yeah. relationship, these are adult conversations that have to be had. That's like, I tell my, my kids, if you're not ready to sit down and talk to somebody about sex, if you're not ready to sit down and bear all literally, let me see what's here. Let me make sure this is healthy. Make Let me make sure nothing is there. Then you're not ready for sex. That's right. No. Yeah, no. And you know, something else that I often have to talk with my clients about is understanding the function of the genitalia that you have, uh, especially this happens for the clients that I see more so with heterosexual couples, mm -hmm. uh, with them having different anatomy. And a lot of the male partners don't understand that the vaginal canal actually lengthens and lubricates. And that's one of the reasons why you can't just be stuffing things mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. off in there because friction, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. bad friction, not good friction. Right. So I think that's something that if we were working on that education and that knowledge, it yeah. helps us be able to, okay, well, this is why this goes like this. It's not just that the woman is frigid or, mm -hmm. you know, what you know, a myriad of names that mm -hmm. <laughs> women are called a prude or whatever mm -hmm. the, the case. I think with that knowledge, then, it, you know, you can, open yourself up to the freedom of discovering things. And I just think that that is what holds so many people back. Yeah, I agree. Mm -hmm. And that's why I think, you know, like Dr. Harris was saying, it's good to know, you know, do you even know what it takes to get yourself there? Like, do you know if you need a clitoral stimulation or if it is penetrative? Because those are going to be two different experiences. Mm -hmm. And you may not be the type of individual where a, a penetrative orgasm is possible. 
-hmm. and you only need uh, clitoral. But if you don't know that because you haven't had conversations or you haven't done any type of self-exploration, then you will have frustration for you know a large chunk of your life. Mm -hmm. Or all the stimulation. Yeah. You can have all of them if you want them. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. Agreed. <laughs> and I think that um, just to help a few of our your male interns, um, a lot of this arousal starts before you get in the bedroom. And so, you know, again, mm -hmm. I've, I've been married for a little while and my husband has learned that one of the most erotic things that he can do for me is to say, honey, I made dinner. <laughs> They got to wash them dishes. <laughs> I know you love some food. Awesome. It, it's all right. The last load is in the dryer. Everything else has yeah. been. Because my, my, instantly my mind is like, oh, okay. I ain't got to do that. Okay. So now you on my things to do list for today. You know, so mm -hmm. right now, you know, that's one of those things that where you help me, we can help each other later. And he has learned that over time. And and again, it just doesn't start in the bedroom. So I think that, right. <laughs> that that's a big, big issue as well. Yeah. yeah. One example I usually give my clients when we're having these kind of conversation is I talk about crock pot versus microwave. Now, this mm -hmm. is going to be very stereotypical, guys. So just kind of run with me here. But I usually talk about my female clients as more of a crock pot. Like mm -hmm. it takes time. But once it's cooking, it's cooking. Mm -hmm. But or it's an oven. Or an oven. Like it's going to take time to get there versus stereotypically men tend to be more microwave. It's a little bit of a faster process. Um so you got to be patient because, like you said, it starts before the bedroom. So when you get ready to cook that pot roast, you had to start at like, you know, 10 o'clock in the morning. Yeah. And it's going to be done by like 7 o'clock. Yeah, you can't cook it. when it's ready, it's ready. Pot roast. Right. <laughs> right. <laughs> right. And when it's ready, it's ready. Fall apart. Right. Mm -hmm. And then I will even go uh, switch to the emotional side. If you're disrespectful to your wife all day and then you think at night she's going to be ready, that's not... That's not gonna happen. She probably gonna be disrespectful to you mm -hmm. by closing them legs. I'm talking to you crazy. <laughs> <laughs> if y'all if y'all not working on y'all communication, right? Mm -hmm. Exactly. So just just understand, like Dr. Harris said, it, for women, for most women, it's emotional. It's an emotional connection. It's an emotional uh, desire. It's 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 about emotion for us, and not necessarily all physical. Not granted. We love the way y'all look sometimes, but I'm just saying. <laughs> yeah. It goes back to what we talked about last February. You know, there are different types of intimacy mm -hmm. and you can't expect sexual intimacy to be detached from all the other ones. They mm -hmm. all feed into each other. Yeah. Emotional, mental, spiritual, like all of those things coincide. And if you only want to have sexual intimacy, you're not even going to have the best version of that that you could have because you're mm -hmm. only limited limiting excuse me it to that one specific intimacy yeah. agreed agreed mm -hmm. yeah. okay well let's see um so why are some potential what are some potential causes for a low libido i know um, it's a good question <laughs> <laughs> and is having low libido normal um, I think that there's a couple of things in that one question um, that you'd have to define. What is normal? Because normal for you could be abnormal for me. And so also, what do you mean by low libido? You know, so is it the fact that, you know, maybe you say, I want to have sex, you know, two times a week. Where I say, well, well, that's not a lot, you know. So I'm thinking, well, you have a low libido, and I might want to have sex every day, you know. But what's normal for me maybe may not be normal for someone else, and so um, we have to be careful with saying that, you know, saying that what's normal and what's not normal, and that comes with the comparison game where people think that, you know, that's what's supposed to happen every mm -hmm. single day once you get married or in a committed relationship and that's you know that's not the norm there's a lot of things that go on with someone who may have a lower libido or lower sex drive and part of that could be the hormones 
Um, mm -hmm. We as women from, you know, from the time we hit puberty um, through menopause, our hormones vary in, you know, the amount. So there's sometimes, you know, that we may be at, at phases of our life where our libido is very high, whereas it may drop down um, and then rise back up. And unfortunately, it doesn't always coincide with the libido of our male partners. And so sometimes it's it can be a hit or miss. And there's like a small window to where everything is, you know, is right on target and everybody's matching uh, with their libido. And then it goes opposite, you know, so it kind of goes in, mm -hmm. and out, in and out. And so you just kind of have to find where the wave is and ride the wave to to make sure that everybody is satisfied <laughs> during the during the riding of the wave. So. <laughs> Um, mm -hmm. One of the things, um, other than hormones um, that are um, that can decrease libido, is someone that may be suffering from depression. Antidepressants can mm -hmm. also um, play a part mm -hmm. in that, as well as birth control. Um, different mm -hmm. types of birth control can cause the libido to be lower. Um, so that's important to make sure that um, women investigate the side effects or um, possible effects of different types of birth control. Mm -hmm. Agreed. Now you said something about uh, when women have male partners and it not necessarily always sinking. Do you see more of a likelihood of a more universal sex drive when it is like two same sex partners because you know sometimes you can hang around people enough and to where it kind of shifts your cycles and y'all end up all within days of each other have you seen any studies on that or in your own experience any changes in that area i've not seen any studies on that just yet um kind of like the the female menstrual cycle it makes sense but again, a lot of external mm -hmm. factors are going to play into that as to whether or not um, the libido is going to be high or whether or not it's going to be low. And again, it's going to all play a part in um, what's normal for that individual. Mm -hmm. okay. Makes sense. Yeah, I still like what you said earlier. That still goes um, goes into the having the conversation with your partner. So that y'all can have that conversation of, of how many times you think, you know, we want to attempt to have. <laughs> that don't mean it's going to happen. Like, OK, we can say three, and strive for three, but that don't mean three is going to happen. Because mm -hmm. life does right. happen. Yes. yes. Adaptability and flexibility. Mm -hmm. So how often should you be tested for an STD or an STI? <laughs> So <laughs> at the minimum, um, someone should be tested yearly. And that is also going to vary depending upon whether or not um, you are high risk, meaning that you just out there swinging and doing all kinds of stuff with whoever pops up, then you own it. So if you're playing a risky game with your with your life, then you should be tested very regularly. Um, mm -hmm. Every three months, I wouldn't even say six months, every two to three months, because of the fact that you're, you're playing a very risky game and you could be um, getting a, a multitude of sexually transmitted infections. Um, one of the things that, um, that we have to keep in mind is that even women that are in committed relationships, um, we know what, you know, what we typically are doing, but you are not always 100% certain of what your partner may be doing. So it's a good idea when you go for your annual well woman exam that you go ahead and be tested. Um, you should be tested for HIV, but again, that's optional. Um, and even the sexually transmitted infections, it's optional when you go to your well woman exam. Mm -hmm. But you should know your status of all of your, um, of all types of infections so that if anything should change, then you can at least pinpoint when or approximately when you may have contracted that and get an idea mm -hmm. of what's going on. 
So it's always good to know the uh, baseline status, including HIV, um, for it, and then monitor for any changes. Again, if you're if you're being very risky and you're not using protection, then of course you need to be tested more often. Mm -hmm. I agree. When you said yeah. HIV, it made me think of uh, Sex in the City when Samantha got tested and she, the, they, she was like, if you get called to that room, that means you got it. And she got called to the room and she fainted, <laughs> but she actually didn't have it. Yeah. I think, you know, it's always odd to me that people don't correlate that, okay, I'm having a lot of sex, even if it's with the one person. And that means maybe I should be getting tested a little mm -hmm. bit more frequently. Because if you think about sex workers, they get tested every time they go in for a scene. Mm -hmm. It's not just, oh, okay. Mm -mm. No, they... Mm -hmm. They want to make sure that they're not passing stuff around mm -hmm. because they are actually being intimate with multiple people all day. Mm -hmm. Makes sense. So, yeah. you know, that recording be for real when you're a sex worker. Yeah. <laughs> so you got to make sure you're you're healthy. Yeah. Because if that was the case, imagine how many sex workers would have oh, yeah. all the diseases. Right. Mm -hmm. And, you know, infections. Okay. And that's not the case. Yeah. So. Mm -hmm. I'm not here for it. Mm -hmm. Well, on the end of getting, you know, medical health care and things like that, how often, not how often, but how soon do you believe that young women should be getting pap smears and mammograms and things like that? Um, the recommended age for starting pap smears for young women is 21. Okay. Um, there used to be times when um, as soon as a female was thought to be sexually active or began having sex that she should come in and have a pap smear. And that's not the case. Um, age 21 is where it's recommended to begin pap smears for a multitude of reasons. But for the most part, um, we know that HPV is uh, rampant and that is sexually transmitted. And so even if a, a, a young person is diagnosed with HPV early, studies have shown that usually um, in the young person that that resolves on its own without any type of treatment or concern for actual cervical cancer. Um, so there's not a need to necessarily investigate um, that before the age of 21. Um, now, if a young person decides, for instance, that she wants to be on birth control, it used to be that they had to have a pap smear before they were allowed to be given birth control. That's not the case. So a, a young person could go and get birth control without having a pap smear. As far as mammograms, um, the American Cancer Society recommends age 40 um, for starting um, baseline mammogram screening. But of course, if you have a family history, you're high risk, you have any type of breast diseases, um, cysts, fibroadenomas, any type of those, any of those things, then you need to make sure that you get uh, a baseline or mammogram screening before the age of 40. So depending upon the individual and their risk, the uh, family history especially, most importantly, then you may need to be getting mammograms much earlier. And do you have any suggestions? Because of course, you know my history um, with how to advocate for yourself when you do have to have those types of conversations. Because I know I've been getting mammograms since I was actually 18. And so it it is a struggle <laughs> to get providers to give that to you, even when you have the history. You really have to be with a provider that you trust and that truly understands your needs. Someone that you're able to talk to, um, because I myself have a history of breast cancer, but it's postmenopausal breast cancer. Mm -hmm. So um, even though I'm not at that age yet to where breast cancer began to run um, on my father's side of the family, I still have to make sure that I get my annual, my annual mammograms. So then there comes a point to where um, some women have been told uh, that they have dense breast tissue. And so with that dense breast tissue, it's important to advocate for yourself, talk to your healthcare provider that I need a follow-up sonogram. 
or ultrasound. We need to make sure that you ask for yourself because they're not going to offer this if you don't tell them this. By you asking for this, this is letting them know that you're educated about your body. The fact that um, dense breast tissue um, is dense breast tissue is important because of the fact that it can hide small tumors, small um, small tumors that could could be cancerous. So it's important to make sure that you get that follow-up sonogram or ultrasound so that um, the tissue can be investigated properly. And so without having that done, early stages of breast cancer can be missed. And so mm -hmm. that's one of the things that um, you do have to advocate from for yourself, which is why it's important to have a provider that you can talk to, that you trust, and that understands what you need as a woman. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And like Dr. Harris said, I know some of our newer interns don't know this information. Like everything that she listed were the things that I had, the dense breast tissue. Um, I typically had a mammogram one six months. The next six months I either had um, a sonogram or breast MRI, like you really have to stay on top of that. And it was actually a self exam for me that discovered mm -hmm. my breast cancer. So I think if, again, if our people are not knowing that these are the things that we need to be talking about and learning and doing for ourselves, I would have essentially passed away mm -hmm. because 40 is a long way mm -hmm. from <laughs> when it was found. Yeah. You know, I'm about to be 40. Mm -hmm. That yeah. was three years ago. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So, you know, you really have to stay on top yeah. of your health care. And that's not something that we do a great job of yeah. in the black and brown community. So we got to push forward to that. Yeah. I know this is kind of off topic, but you did mention mm -hmm. mammogram. So that leads to breast. And part of my... um I guess I'd say my doctoral studies focused on um, breast cancer. And uh -huh. so I, my study specifically was um, finding out if um, women were educated, Black women were educated uh -huh. on breastfeeding and their decreased risk of breast cancer if they would be more likely to breastfeed. Lots of women see that, okay, breastfeeding is great. Breastfeeding is supposed to help save money. It's good for the baby, yada, yada, yada. But breastfeeding your child actually decreases a woman's risk of breast cancer premenopausal. Um, oh, wow. one, of the, one of the things that, that. Mm -mm. yeah, one of the things that women don't understand is, yeah, we want you to breastfeed your child and any amount of breastfeeding is helpful, but the longer, the better. The longer you can breastfeed, the more it can decrease your risk. And again, a premenopause of breast cancer. So that's generally mm -hmm. breast cancer before the age of 40, before the age of 50. It yeah. decreases your risk. Um, anybody who lives long enough, your risk of cancer of any type is going to go up. But specifically, mm -hmm. breastfeeding helps with um, that premenopause of breast mm -hmm. cancer. And not only that, it also um, it's tied to the fact that us as Black women, we have a higher incidence of the triple negative mm -hmm. uh, breast cancer, which is more aggressive. And that specifically is what breastfeeding helps to decrease in Black women. Yeah. So just, I know, like you said, this is, I know this is off topic, but just in case we have interns with little children and they want to know what's the longest time you can <laughs> breastfeed, let's go ahead and answer that question. <laughs> The longest time you can breastfeed is the time agreed upon between you and that child. Okay. So what you're comfortable with. If you feel like you want to breastfeed your child to their three, that's up to you and how comfortable you are with that. Um, if you want to breastfeed your child to your five, you know. <laughs> Look, we all have, have personal to, and professional answers. Yes. <laughs> you have to decide what is best for you and your child. I mean, I've known some kids that have breastfed till, you know, they were five, six years old. They would go to school and come home and mm -hmm. they'd get a snack when they got home. And 
you know, that's what they have decided worked for them. And that's okay too, I guess, you know, but the deal is, is that uh, breastfeeding is important for our health, for our breast health, Mm -hmm. especially. And so um, I'm always an advocate of, you know, try it, try it. The easier, the more you do it, the easier it gets and the better it is for both you and baby. Mm-hmm. Now y'all imagine this being your sister and she like, she never was really pushing the baby on me, but she was like, when are you going to have the baby so you can breastfeed? Mm-hmm. And so, you know, she's had this research for a really, really long time. So we, we knew the older I got, the more likelihood that I was going to have some form of breast cancer. So it, it leads me to think like if I had been able to find my boot, my boot thing at a young age, and breastfed, you know, I probably would have been able to kind of push it out. Yeah. 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 yeah, that definitely makes sense. Yeah, but she was yeah. on my neck. <laughs> yeah, oh. Let me let me show you this uh this article. That's what it says. I, I can't make him come any <laughs> sooner than he's coming. But he's here now. Yeah. Possibly. Mm-hmm. Possibly. Mm-hmm. <laughs> thank you. Oh no, uh, she Dr. she with y'all. Thank She's you, Dr. Y'all. Harris. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you. <laughs> don't, don't y'all start. Yeah, yeah that's a whole nother. This is, not a this, okay? this is not a disbron. This is not a This is a shrink wrap. Because okay? I'm ready to go off. Okay. <laughs> yes. Anyway, next question. Uh, <laughs> what changes should a woman expect to see in her reproductive system throughout her lifetime and uh, kind of give us some normal and abnormal things to kind of be aware of? Um, again, a woman's hormones is, they're going to change. They're going to fluctuate. So... From the time that she's a teenager, there's going to be the same hormones throughout her lifetime. They just go up and they just go down. So your hormones are going to change as you get into your more mature years where you're um, actually having children. Again, you're going to have an influx of hormones to help support a pregnancy. After pregnancy, you're still going to have an influx of hormones to help stabilize your your body to get things ready for breastfeeding. Um, And then again, after your childbearing time, you're going to go through or your body is going to prepare for menopause, that premenopausal time to where the hormones may start as far as your female hormones may start to decline gradually for some women and drastically, you know, for others, depending upon whether or not you've reached menopause in a natural way, or if you've reached Mm -hmm. menopause by chance by hysterectomy, um, that can be a drastic onset of menopause. And so with that, you can expect for, um, you know, You can expect for vaginal changes to occur where there may not be as much lubrication as there once was before. And of course, there's some different types of gentle um, lubricants that you can use to help with that. Um, Some people also use different types of hormonal products to assist with that as well. Um, And it's based upon the preference as well as the the woman's health history as to which would be best for her. Um, There could be um, changes in the vagina itself to where things are a little bit more, um, I should say, mm, a little bit more sensitive. So um, things um, without the same amount of Uh, estrogen that has previously been present. Um, Things are a little bit more sensitive. Things may become a little bit more fragile, um, uh, easier to um, bleed or tear. So it's very important to make sure that, um, especially as an older woman, you pay attention to your body and the, the different changes that are occurring. Yeah, I think something that doesn't get talked about a lot is perimenopausal. Um, cause I learned, my doctor told me that I was perimenopausal probably about five years ago. And I was like, what? I thought I had PCOS. And she was like, no, you're, you're, <laughs> you're perimenopausal. And I was like, what is that? Like I had, that term had never entered my vocabulary. So, you know, I'm all on Google, like what in the world is perimenopausal? Um, so I think that's something that we don't really prepare because, you know, when you're in your mid thirties, early, very early 40s, you know, we don't consider that to be middle-aged. 
Um, even though technically it is, even though technically it is, but we, you know, societally don't consider that to be middle age. So there's this weird, you know, section of adulthood where things are happening, things are changing, but nobody's explaining to you like, oh, this is your body preparing itself. So when you hit 40, 45, 50, 55, you know, this is what is going to actually happen, but it's starting now. Yeah. And, and even in that same vein, we're not learning about perimenstrual either. Mm-hmm. Like that's a whole term, mm-hmm. you know, there's just a lot that we don't know. And we're just like walking through life. Like mm-hmm. I'm going to figure it happening. out. Not. <laughs> yeah. And we that's- don't ask questions either. So we don't even ask like, girl, are you experiencing this? We like, we're yeah. embarrassed to ask questions. Yeah. Yeah. That phase is also what I, what I like to call the, um, the awakening phase of womanhood because you you come to a point where you realize that there's so much youth that you now don't have <laughs> <laughs> yes and and then you're trying to figure out where did it go and then mm-hmm. you stop and you take a look at what you have ahead of you mm-hmm. in terms of okay so now my body is doing this so that means Oh, I am getting older because mm-hmm. you don't just wake up and bam, you're in menopause. It's right. it's small, gradual things along the way that if you aren't familiar with your body, you won't you you will miss them, and you mm-hmm. will you you can easily mistake them for other things. Mm-hmm. And Google and WebMD, you know, they're notorious for giving us all type of diagnoses. You you can fit yourself into whatever it is you you think you might have just by googling it so Mm -hmm. be careful with that agreed (laughs) so our final question that we have and of course we can continue talking is what is one thing that you wish your younger self had known prior to adulthood about your body you want a professional answer? I won't. Oh. <laughs> okay. I'm like, look, this, I can give you a laundry list. <laughs> I think that um, I wish my younger self would have known that. Um, um, let me try to try to find something as simple. Um, I wish that my younger self would have known how valuable and cherished. Gina should be. Mm-hmm. I think that mm-hmm. um, society, um, as well as you know, social media, it's on display as um, something to be used and tossed about. And I think that that there needs to be more care with with how we treat her. And you know she's she's that other person. So um, I I think we need to we we do need to value her more because if we value her more, then we can value the whole person more. Yeah, mm-hmm. like and that's as a, a word. Mm-hmm. As a <laughs> as a younger person, I didn't understand that. No one told me. Mm-hmm. I just kind of had to figure that out along the way. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Now, in the unprofessional sense, I would say, um, I wish that I, I, I think it's still on the same lines. I think that I wish that I had known how powerful she can be. Mm-hmm. That That's part. another word. Mm-hmm. <laughs> You're following that. Yeah. Look, countries have <laughs> fell. Yes. <laughs> because of the V. Mm-hmm. Yes. Um, yes. what, what about y'all ladies? What are some things that y'all wish y'all had known? <sighs> Again, I could give you a lot of <laughs> which I had known. Um, but uh, I think I wish I had known when I was younger that the way I look is okay. Mm-hmm. You know, that I don't need to be a certain size. I don't need to do my hair a certain way. Like I don't have to look a certain way. Um, and this is going to sound so pompous, but I've never had a problem attracting male attention. Mm-hmm. But as a young person, I, I had this idea that I had to do certain things and be certain ways in order to gain it. But as I've gotten older, realizing like you can literally just walk out and just be looking 
just as rough and mm -hmm. it's okay. Um, and my husband don't really care at all. <laughs> <laughs> he don't. He don't like literally he sleep in your you. eye, crusty, you know, drool on the side. He like, come here, baby. Mm -hmm. Give me all of that. Mm -hmm. um, so I wish I would have known that it was okay to just be comfortable with me mm -hmm. and, and not trying to force certain things. I wish I would have, my younger self would have known that I bring more to the table than just Gina. Because, mm -hmm. um, you know, we are objectified. Mm -hmm. And although that wasn't the lifestyle I was living, I was single a lot because I wasn't out there like that. So, mm -hmm. um, but I still wish I would have understood my worth and that I am more than just Gina. Yeah, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. that's good. Yeah. I think for me, I wish I had learned that perfection is not enough, nor is it attainable. Because, mm. you know, when mm -hmm. when you are deemed like a goody two shoes or whatever, you're always striving to like be perfect. And for people, your perfection is not going to attain um, attraction or not being rejected or value. Mm -hmm. And at the end of the day, it's still not going to be enough. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You have to learn how to kind of surround yourself with people who are your tribe. And it took me a really long time to learn that and always feeling like left out. So I wish I had known that about myself as well as my body. Like I, being a dancer, being an athlete, you put yourself through a lot of stuff that is really not the healthiest mm -hmm. to put yourself through. Mm -hmm. Like mm -hmm. now when I'm in my perimental uh, <laughs> menopausal status. I'm like, mm -mm, I that, that, that don't right make now. Death, no sense. Drops. <laughs> Girl, I wish I would do a jump split. Mm -mm. I'm not doing <laughs> no. mm -mm. But, you know, I think that's probably, I wish I had learned that earlier. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I think one last thing I, I wish, and I love my parents, and I always say this on every, I love my parents, and I this is no shade to my parents, but I didn't learn anything about sex at all mm -hmm. from my parents at all. Everything I had to learn through experience. Um, now my brother got a very different experience um, than I did. He's way younger than I am. Mm -hmm. um, so I wish I would have, cause I, I ended up going through a lot of things that I probably would not have gone through had my parents be, felt comfortable um, at least giving me even the basic mm -hmm. information. Gotcha. So, yeah. Gotcha, gotcha. Well, I think also that as 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 females, we do get a little bit of difference in what we learn from our parents, if anything, than males, because mm -hmm. males, you know, males are typically instructed, you know, when you have sex, use a condom. But I mean, as far as anything further than that, you can't guarantee that they get any more than that. But girls are more or less told don't do it. You know, um, I was just yes. I was just getting ready to say how how are boys taught to use condoms and we're taught to stay away. So it's like that does not match. Yeah. So, <laughs> so, there's, so there's a there's a big gap in that and and what we what we have to learn as yeah, well as yeah. what we need to teach um, mm -hmm. younger women um, about their bodies and and they still need to to know also use condoms. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yep. Yeah, I agree with all that. Yes, man. Well, ladies, do y'all have any other questions for Dr. Harris? Or Dr. Harris, do you have any questions for us? <laughs> this no. Is yes. questions. I did learn a couple things. I was like, oh, okay, I didn't realize that. Yes, I, you know, I, I definitely thank you, Dr. Harris, for uh, being confident in the information that you're sharing with our interns because I think we try to we we make sure we. Um, try to provide education to the community. And I think your uh, presence and your information uh, definitely, al definitely aligned with what we try to bring to our interns. So thank you so much for your confidence and your information. Absolutely. Well, thank you all for having me. <laughs> yes, she is. Okay. Well, interns, you know, we know this is our first 
month back. So we're hoping that you are enjoying the lineup of things that we have. Uh, March is going to be a lot too, you know, so just be prepared for that. <laughs> <laughs> do y'all want to go ahead and announce the movie since we haven't announced it this month yet and because that's going to be the next thing that they they see oh yeah, oh, yeah. we're doing she's gotta have it <laughs> she's gotta have it a spike lee joint <laughs> since we're talking about you know sex <laughs> <laughs> i cannot <laughs> All right. Well, we will see you guys on the next one. We hope you enjoyed. Again, thank you, Dr. Harris, for joining us. We really appreciate it. Um, and all right, I guess. Bye, guys. Of all the forms of inequality, injustice in health is the most shocking and inhumane. Dr. Martin Luther King, Jr. Mm -hmm.